Gosh, Peter, to, to start with this story, um, what was that first incarnation of wanting to tell this story? I mean, you lived your whole life more without him than with him, but what was that catalyst to get this going? I mean, this, this is a very emotional story to tell. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, my my brother died when I was five years old, and uh, I was the youngest in the family, and he was the oldest. He, he was almost 20 years older than me, so I didn't really know him. Um, and so I kind of grew up with a hazy knowledge of who he was, and I... And I um, I do remember that he made a movie uh, that is featured in my movie. He made a little like cops and robbers movie. So when I was growing up, we would watch that and we knew it was Jimmy's movie. And then when I got a little older, I started making Super 8 films. And then in grad school, I made Super 8 films that went on to film festivals. So I thought, oh, I, you know, I like to make films like Jimmy did. Um, in the meantime, I had learned a lot of kind of conflicting and confusing things about him because I didn't really remember him because I was five when he died. Uh, in Saigon, Vietnam, you know, I originally thought he died in the war. And then I later found out that he had gone back as a civilian. And I think the older I got, the more I thought, oh, this is unusual. This is an unusual story. And the more I told it to people, they thought it was an unusual story and worth telling. Um, and in um, undergrad and grad school, I met Dan Savage, who is our uh, executive producer. And he was actually my partner, my boyfriend at the time. And I was making these short films. And he said, you should really make a film about your other because it's really like an intense interesting story and I sort of stored that away I think this is what happens sometimes is like somebody uh, a mentor or a friend or a relative will will give us some advice and we'll sort of store it away and then we'll access it later so that was in the 90s and then in 2010 I retrieved that information from my mind I had been um, I was in between jobs I was living in New York City and I thought you know maybe I'll do something new and different. And so I started meeting documentary filmmakers in Brooklyn and I ran this idea by them. And I said, is this a good idea to make this film about my brother? And I remember my biggest concern was he died 38 years ago. You know, does anyone care about something that happened that long ago or is it too late? And they essentially said like, on the contrary, no, it's really interesting. So I, then I went to my mom and I kind of asked her blessing and said, I really want to do this. Um, I did kind of call it an oral history at that point rather than a documentary. And uh, she got me going with names of people. And basically, I spent the last few dollars I had on uh, HD, HD camera and sound equipment. And I tra started traveling the country to uh, meet people that knew my brother. Let's take that next step. You, you utilize Indigo or Indiegogo. Yes. And then you're traveling to Vietnam not too long after yes. that. Yeah, so I started making the film in 2010. I thought I would go to Vietnam right away. It took me about six years to get to the point where I could go to Vietnam. But in 2016, we went, um, raised money through Indiegogo. It was an amazing trip. Um, we didn't necessarily find exactly what we wanted, but we got really far along the path. And then I had a major discovery in 2018 that allowed us to finish the film. So. As far as that travel structure going over there, um, building your team to do that, knowing you're going to have a small team and you're going to have to rely on a lot of people over there and a lot of, like you said, you're not sure where this journey is going to go. Mm -hmm. What was going through your mind? What was this experience like? I mean, this is years in the making, but it's it must be taxing just to kind of physically figure out what to do. Yeah, as a first time documentary filmmaker, it, it was intimidating to me. I was really, really lucky that I found a, a DP who lived in Saigon, who was an American, Brett Hamilton, who uh, did all of our footage in Vietnam and a lot of our LA footage. And, uh, you know, he was literally 24 years old, the same uh, age Jimmy was when he passed away. And it was very touching to me that Brett was an American expatriate in Saigon and was also like a extremely talented cinematographer so you know I really um, he was really my right-hand man in 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 Saigon with those shoots we also had a couple wonderful uh, fixers they're called like interpreters that Vietnamese uh, people that work in the film industry and help um, guide us through all of our interviews. So between Brett and the, the fixers, we were in really good shape. We had a really small crew. Um, it was just basically me and them. And uh, the first shoot, we had a sound guy. We had a government um, helper. And uh, I was really scared the night before we started our, our shooting, but it just worked out really well. You brought up your mom earlier. Yes. 
can we talk a bit about the importance of the interview? We get to see the the moments of her, but also there are things lure, like you said earlier, about Jimmy that you unearth and you you know can be difficult to go through. Yeah. How is that relationship with your mother, and what was her? view of what you were doing I mean it's a fascinating back and forth but her blessing I think is the reason why I did it yeah absolutely I mean she's the matriarch of our family she's just turned 98 uh, now and in June 2022 and um, my father passed away uh, almost um, 10 years ago but my mom is um, in really good shape you know uh, mentally and so she's very aware of the journey she doesn't want to see the film and she's very apologetic to me about it she says she's supportive of me she loves me she loves the fact that I'm doing it, but it's just too painful for her to watch. And, and yet, you know, she gave me the greatest gift, which was to, um, allow me to film her, you know, over the last 12 years. So, um, the most important thing was to talk to her and hear about what she felt about my brother and his life and his death. And, um, and I think beyond that, she's kind of like, you know, she might change her mind at some point, but I'm not too worried about it. Like she's, she has seen chunks of it, you know, it's funny because I was kind of trying to keep it from her because she said she didn't want to see it and she ended up seeing like some pretty large chunks kind of by accident and I said what'd you think and she's like oh I liked it you know so I was like okay it wasn't as traumatic as I thought so we'll see I'm curious as as far as your view of your brother how much were you shocked how much were you ah that makes sense how many how do you view your brother now compared to before this project. I mean, he was just a, a glimpse, a memory. Yeah. Of anything before. Yeah. I mean, I've learned a lot about him. I think I've learned more also about the nature of, um, like privacy and like how we construct our lives because I thought if I talked with lots of his friends then all of a sudden a very clear picture would come into place but really um, he was very compartmentalized and different friends knew different things but um, you know he was he was pretty mysterious person I, I mean we did find out a lot and he he told some little white lies you know he was sort of as I think you know probably we all do and we're in our teens or early 20s and talking to our parents like you know we don't want every aspect of our life to be known by our family so um, you know I I think that uh, I, I love the fact that he, we have like 200 letters that he wrote he had letters that he wrote to my parents and to other people and we have all of his belongings or a lot of his belongings and we have photos and uh, one of the things that I've said is I would love to turn this into some sort of an exhibit museum exhibit that we can send around sort of a snapshot of a life kind of thing you talk about the music in this film and yeah. in a, another family connection? Yes. Um, our brother John, John McDowell, is a professional film composer, and he wrote the music to Jimmy and Saigon. Uh, when I decided to start making the film, I reached out to him right away and said I wanted him to, to write the music. Um, he wrote the music to an Academy Award-winning documentary called Born Into Brothels, won uh, Oscar for Best Doc in 2004, and he's done a lot of films since then, so I knew there was nobody better to work with than him. Um, and he knew my brother, he knew Jimmy even better than I did because, um, whereas I was five years old when Jimmy died, my brother, John was 17 when Jimmy died. So, um, or yeah, something, no 14, I think when Jimmy died. So, um, so at any rate, he knew him really well. And so it was hard for him. He said it was hard for him to watch the film every day when he was composing the music, but he got through it. Was he in Archangels? He was. Then? Yes, yeah. he was. Um, when you watched that film for the first time, what were you thinking? What emotions did you have knowing that this is something you're interested in, and yet he's he did this as well? There's a connection there that is really interesting. The Archangel Blues yeah. film? Um, yeah. I mean, I was so young when I watched it that all I knew was that it was kind of like a family project, but I think a kid a kid feels like oh my god especially in the 70s you think like wow somebody made a movie like that was before handheld video cameras you know it was before any of that so it was um it seemed like magic to me 
What did it mean to you that this film was brought into Bentonville knowing uh, Gina and Wendy and the team are looking for diversity? They're looking for yeah. highlighting diverse films and filmmakers. Um, what was that acceptance like for you? It was great. Uh, I was so thrilled to be accepted to Bentonville and to learn more about the festival. We've mostly been at um, LGBTQ festivals around the world, but this one is, you know, kind of open to everything and all with a bit of a focus on on diversity. And uh, so we were very honored to be part of this um, uh, festival. And uh, I've heard so many great things about Northwest Arkansas in terms of the uh, infrastructure for the arts, the, the museum and um, and all of the you know the arts funding here so I was I was really excited to come bridging of both your worlds I know you're very much involved in art so I am um, have you been to Crystal Bridges yet? I'm going to go to Crystal Bridges. I haven't been yet, but yeah, it's been on my list. I used to work for the Louvre Museum, mm -hmm. and that's when I first heard about Crystal Bridges as being you know, one of the world's most important new museums. Um, I believe the Louvre has collaborated with Crystal Bridges before. So yeah, so it was it was a no-brainer to me when, when I heard that we got accepted, I knew I wanted to come here. Speaking of your other film festivals, opening in London, as a very prestigious festival. What was that experience like? And also keeping it as a global film, I think, because of obviously the connection to Saigon, but I think this is a film that needs to be seen by anyone and everyone because it is so universal because it, it's a bridging of gaps. Thank you. Yeah, the opening in London was incredible. Uh, British Film Institute's Flair Festival was the first festival that invited us. Um, it's a very... Um, it's just a great festival and our two screenings sold out immediately which was crazy for me it was wonderful and when we showed up and and actually did the screenings in south bank which is a part of london i i hadn't really been to before um the audiences went wild and were um cheering and came up to talk to me afterwards and i just really felt like the london audiences um really um engaged in this topic that doesn't you know necessarily have to do with their country or their history but they had so many questions and so many comments about it. And I felt that the themes of uh, family loss and trauma and grief um, really transcended backgrounds. They transcended all of that because um, people, no matter where you're from, people have those experiences. Same thing happened in Italy, a festival that we went to there. People were really engaged and we ended up winning the festival, which was really exciting. We won Best Documentary. So how heartwarming it is to have those reactions from people i mean it must i know it must have been cathartic for you and your family but to see other people impacted that's got to be another level yeah absolutely people come up to me in tears afterwards and they sort of tell me their story and it, it's obviously never the same story but it's not too far away um and um some people have come to see the film multiple times so I feel like it's got a life out there that's the most important thing for me I didn't want it to fall into obscurity and I think it's safe to say that after these six festivals that we'll get to a place where um, many people will be able to see it you know going off just the photos that you have of left of Jimmy mm -hmm. when you see the place when you see the elements of where the photos were taken what was that feeling I can't imagine like you there at that at this late of time in the same photo that it's got to be surreal to some experience. Yeah, I mean, I love I love history. I've I've lived abroad before. I lived in France and Germany um, when I was uh, younger, and just to sort of see the the path of history and to see that and feel that in in Vietnam was amazing. Um, we tried to find all the locations where he lived in in Saigon a lot of them have changed and some of them are the same um, so it was it was a remarkable experience and I hope to be able to bring people um, I I raised all the money for this film myself two hundred thousand dollars from about five to six hundred people and some of those have become you know really good friends and really great supporters of the film so I'm hoping to take some people over to Vietnam at some point and kind of walk walk my friends through the places where we filmed the, the movie I'll be really special really cool. yeah um, has the filmmaking bug the documentary bug bit you is that 
what we can anticipate for you? Are you looking to continue this journey? Yeah, I would love to. Um, I, you know, my, my, my energy right now is on, um, I feel like with Jimmy and Saigon, I just had a baby and I have to like get the baby into preschool and kindergarten first. But beyond that, I really love music. I love music documentaries. Um, I have said before that I'm really interested. Um, I haven't approached them yet, but I'm interested in the idea of making a documentary about the musical group, the roaches, which is a group of three sisters from, um, East coast. And, um, they were popular in the seventies, eighties, nineties. Um, I'm interested in, um, because my story had a little bit of a topic of, of hidden queer stories, hidden LGBTQ stories. Um, I went to a, a queer history conference in San Francisco last week and I learned about a lot of other hidden stories and I immediately thought these would make great documentaries. So, uh, that's another thought I have many thoughts about lots of things to make. If that becomes your niche, that's an awesome niche. To yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Peter, thank you for making this movie. Thank you for having the boldness to tell this story, a personal story that you're sharing with us. So, uh, thank you. And thank you for bringing it to Bentonville. Great. Thank you.